So I'm going to speak about optimizing recognition and treatment of advanced HIV disease in children and adolescents. This is quite a huge topic, so forgive me if I'm two minutes over time. Um, and when I first um, was started to get involved with this, I was approached by some colleagues at WHO um, to be involved in a policy brief. And they asked the questions of what I think is causing advanced HIV disease in children and what are the potential strategies and solutions. And my sincere answer at the time was this. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, this is Professor Helena Rabi from our institution as well. Um, many of you in the room will know her. And she has actually treated hundreds and possibly thousands of children with advanced HIV over the years. She's probably the queen of advanced HIV. Mo, maybe you're the king. <laughs> um, so if you aren't lucky enough to have uh, Helena Rabi at your facility, I think you will need some guidelines. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. What do we actually mean by advanced HIV disease in children? And how does this differ from adults? I'm going to talk about the burden of advanced disease in children and then use four cases to highlight different clinical presentations. And as I go through those cases, I'm going to pr try to present some updates on recent data that will inform us. So we don't have a Mentimeter for this one, but maybe you can just raise your hands. Which of these children do you think have advanced HIV disease? A, a three-month-old with severe pneumonia and a CD4 count of more than 25%. Don't be shy. Yes, advanced HIV disease. See some hands. Okay, B, a six week growing well on the, on the plus one Z score, a great CD4 percentage, asymptomatic and diagnosed during a routine PMTCT visit. Does this child have advanced disease? Got one taker. <laughs> a two year old with moderate malnutrition and a CD4 of more than 25%. A seven-year-old on ART that presents with sores, possibly oral herpes around the mouth, or a 10-year-old with a standard pulmonary TB. Some hands. <laughs> Mark, you're not allowed to vote. <laughs> okay, so I'm briefly going to talk now about the timeline of advanced HIV-related guidelines and policies. And it was only actually in 2015 that we decided to treat everyone with HIV. It seems like we've been doing this forever, but it was only 2015. And yet still after WHO recommended this, we found that people were still presenting late, either severely ill or with low CD4 counts. And this led to some trials, um, the REALITY trial and the REMSTART trial, which informed WHO guidance in 2017 um, and brought, when they brought out their advanced HIV guidelines. Alongside this, there's been a lot of developments with cryptococcal meningitis, especially the AMBITION trial, and this led to WHO updating their cryptococcal meningitis guidelines last year. And finally, in 2023, WHO has come with a, a policy brief on providing care to people who are severely ill. So what causes um, mortality in children and adolescents admitted to hospital. This is old data from 2015, and I've put a box around what causes mortality in children. It's no surprise the usual suspects, TB, pneumocystis, bacterial infections and bacterial pneumonia, diarrhea and malnutrition. But what I want you to notice is that in young children less than five years old, there's no cryptococcal meningitis. And as you will see, many of the studies informing the guidance focus on cryptococcal meningitis. So this was the REALITY trial. Um, what they did was they, in, in adults predominantly starting ART with a CD4 count of less than 100, they randomized them to receive enhanced prophylaxis versus standard of care. Standard of care was basically cotrimoxazole prophylaxis. And um, later on, many of the participants in the standard of care arm also received INH prophylaxis after 12 weeks of starting ART. The enhanced prophylaxis was 12 weeks of INH and B6, 12 weeks of fluconazole, 
five days of azithromycin to try to prevent bacterial infections and a single dose of albendazole. And this trial really had great results. You can see decreases in everything, but what I want you to note is there were no children less than five years enrolled in the study and only 4% between 5 and 17 years old. But this study then informed the WHO guidelines um, in 2017, and these guidelines included a definition for advanced HIV disease in children. So if you're older than 5 and, you're, and you have a CD4 count less than 200 or stage 3 or 4 WHO disease, you have advanced disease, and all children less than five years of age actually have advanced HIV disease. And this is based on old data where we know that children um, with HIV, especially young infants, progress regardless of CD4 count. Then a policy brief that came in 2020 redefined children less than five years of age they still have advanced HIV. However, if you have been stable, clinically stable and on ARVs for more than a year, you shouldn't be prevented from accessing multi-month um, dispensing. So we don't want to make it harder for children and increase pull burden. So this policy brief um, used the acronym STOP AIDS. We want to screen, treat, optimize and prevent. And those are evidence-based interventions that were included in the policy brief. But why are we still talking about um, advanced HIV disease in this day and age in 2023? And um, both of these panels include data from CROI, which basically shows that children, especially children less than one, have higher mortality rates than younger children and then adults. And on the other panel, you can see the white um, triangle shows that children also increasingly have lower rates of viral suppression. Um, this is data from Kim Anderson, who's in the audience. It looked at children starting ART at less than three months um, in Cape Town between 2013 and 2017. And you can see that 70% of these children were hospitalized, 36% 36, 36 had more than one hospital admission, 41% had pneumonia, and 23% gastroenteritis. And then the bar graph data in the other panel, if you look at the, the gray portion of the bars, you can see this is time spent um, with severe immune suppression. And you can see that this is actually increasing in later years rather than decreasing. Closer to home, um, this is data from an amazing medical student. She's a fifth year medical student where we were trying to look at um, causes of hospital mortality in children with HIV in our wards pre and post COVID. But I want, what I want you to notice is that 70% of these children had already had an HIV diagnosis prior to admission. 80% had to have social work involvement. Only 8% of children were suppressed. Many children needed ICU admissions, more of them in the post-COVID period than in the pre-COVID period. So if we look at clinical presentations of advanced HIV disease, um, I like to think of it uh, along a timeline. So I think in adults, you can either have a CD4 count of less than 200 and appear relatively well, or you can present ill. But I think in children, you can really present at any time. The top um, headings refer to an undiagnosed child who usually prevents ill, but I think more and more what we're seeing, at least in South Africa, is that children are diagnosed, started on ARVs, but somehow fall through the cracks and present with advanced HIV disease again. So I think a typical presentation that we see is an infant who's usually two to three months old, and this is just my schema of how I think they can present. But of course, these presentations and causes can overlap. We had an infant like this um, in April in our wards, a four-month-old boy weighing 1.8 kilos only at birth, born b before arrival, not much um, access to the health system before. And he presented with a two-day history of cough, blocked nose, and fast breathing. You can see his x-ray on the side, um, terrible-looking x-ray. He was treated with ampicillin, gentamicin, high-dose crotramoxazole, gancyclovir, prednisone, and empirical TB treatment, but unfortunately required intubation and ventilation, um, and actually did quite well after a period of time on CPAP. So this is really a typical presentation of PJP that we see 
Often um, there's data to show that it's not only PJP, but also a CMV co-infection or bacterial or other viral co-infection. Um, and what could we have done using our WHO policy brief? We could have screened. I think early diagnosis is hugely important. It's the gateway to cotrimoxazole prophylaxis and early ART initiation. Um, we treat, as I mentioned before, we could optimize by using early ARVs and we need to prevent, we need to vaccinate according to standard EPI um, vaccinations and we need to um, give cotrimoxazole pre prevention as well as TPT. So what's being done in this area um, is the empirical trial. I'm sure many of you saw this at CROI, um, but this is a trial that's looking at empirical treatment against CMV and TB. Um, it includes young infants in six African countries and the data from this that was presented is really um, scary. So they enrolled 310 children, um, and I think 44% of the total cohort died. The majority of the diagnoses of HIV were made in hospital, um, and you can see 25% of the cohort died in hospital, and 19% died post-hospital. So in this um, initial report, the probability of 15 day and 12 month survival was 71 and 50% respectively. And I really think that we can, I mean, this is trial conditions as well. I really think we need to do a whole lot better than this. Okay, so the second presentation is um, a child who's more of a toddler or older child between two to five years old. Um, they often present with severe bacterial infections, tuberculosis, which I'll speak about a bit later, or malnutrition and diarrhea, and again, they can have an overlapping um, presentation. Older studies show that there's a high rate of bacteremia in children that are starting ARVs, especially in the first three months, and more recently, I think this is Mo's study, 6% um, of children admitted with severe malnutrition and HIV had a positive blood culture on admission, and then there's a high risk of having a hospital-acquired hospital infection during that admission, and these are mostly gram negatives and ESBLs. In terms of malnutrition, there have been two major studies that have informed when we start ARVs in severely malnourished children, and I think the WHO guidelines suggest starting ART within seven days um, after admission. I'm going to try to speed it up. So we've had a, a boy who's still in the ward who presented exactly like this with chronic diarrhea and then um, developed a hospital-acquired gram-negative infection during his hospital stay. Again, if we use our STOP, we could have screened for malnutrition and TB. We, we need to screen for, um, we need to be able to have access to blood cultures. We need appropriate antibiotics. Sometimes our first line antibiotics are just not appropriate. This child needed specific attention to electrolyte management and fluid replacement, the WHO 10 steps for managing malnutrition, and most importantly, this child was already on antiretrovirals. So antiretrovirals are just not enough. Um, what he needs is intense adherence, counseling, possibly social worker intervention. Okay, so just in terms of severe bacterial infections, we know that HIV is actually a risk factor for the development of drug-resistant bacterial infections. There have been two studies of hospitalized children which showed that um, blood infections in HIV-positive children had an increased likelihood of being resistant isolates, and that corresponded with an increased sepsis mortality risk. And a study in, in Tanzania showed that HIV-infected children were more likely to get the wrong empirical treatment and, again, a higher risk in mortality. So we need to think about what the appropriate antibiotics that we're giving are. I'm not going to speak about azithromycin. I think azithromycin was omitted from the package of care um, in the guidelines and is quite complex. Many people are worried about um, antimicrobial resistance. Azithromycin is a whole topic in itself. Okay, so now onto the well older child. So this boy was seen um, about two years ago and he started ARVs, um, sorry, he was diagnosed with HIV as an outpatient. His mom was unaware of her diagnosis and he had a small amount of weight loss but nothing too concerning. He had a lowish CD4 and he has an extensive screen for TB before he started ARVs. So he had a normal chest X-ray 
Um, that was his chest X-ray at diagnosis. Um, he had sputa sent for gene expert and TB culture, which was all negative. And then he started ART shortly afterwards. He presented at HIV clinic um, about two months later, just with vomiting. So he had no headache, no fever, and no other clinical signs. We decided to LP him, and his LP had a high lymphocyte count, a high protein, and was gene expert positive for tuberculosis. So he started on tuberculosis meningitis therapy, and, and this is a case of iris, possibly, but just goes to show how careful you have to follow up children that start ARVs. So what's new for, in terms of TB? Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll skip through this, but WHO recommends in children less than 10 years screening using cough, fever, TB exposure, or poor weight gain. But two studies have now shown um, that this often overcalls it and that symptomatic-based screening alone may not be the answer. In terms of diagnosis, we can now use the Panther score for HIV-infected children. It has a high sensitivity. Um, the Panther study also found that non-tuberculous mycobacteria to be almost as common as TB. Um, there are various other methodologies, including chest x-ray, point of care ultrasound, as well as the new um, Fuji LAM. However, LAM has a low sensitivity um, and it can't be used as a rule out test. In terms of treatment, there have been two great studies led by Anna Tukova. One which shows that we can now use four months of TB treatment instead of six months. However, this study had few HIV-positive children, wasn't powered to look at it in HIV-positive children. WHO has also included more details about the timing of ART initiation in children with TB co-infection. However, this is still predominantly based on expert opinion. In those with HIV that are more than 12 with a higher CD4 count, we can now use short-course moxifloxacin and rifapentine, and we've shown that it's safe to use BD dolutegravir in children on TB treatment. Unfortunately for TB prevention, there's been a lot of talk, but we still don't have access for children with HIV to 3-HP. We cannot use this in children younger than two years, and we can only use 1-HP in children older than 13. So we still have work to do, and I still think there is um, a huge need for a combined fixed-dose combination of INH, prof, um, INH, cotrimoxazole, and B6. So last case, this was a seriously ill older child. Again, this is just my schema of how these children can present. There's many possible diagnoses. Um, he was 10 years old, diagnosed with HIV in August last year, and started ARVs relatively quickly. He had a very low CD4 count. Um, in October, he represented and was diagnosed with RIF monoresistant TB, started on treatment. I think there's a session about this later on, so I won't talk about that. Um, he came back in November with difficulty swallowing. He needed fluconazole for esophageal candidiasis, and then he developed seizures in December of that year. And he actually came to our HIV clinic because he got lost. He was supposed to be going to the MDR-TB clinic. But he arrived in a wheelchair, very ill, sick, headache, vomiting. And his LP, after a CT brain was done, actually showed that he had cryptococcus um, as well. So just because you have one advanced disease doesn't mean you can't have another. Um, we treated him with amphotericin B, flucytosine when we could find it, as well as uh, fluconazole. And just to say that um, the Ambition trial has informed us that the optimal first-line treatment is liposomal amphotericin B as well as flucytosine for the induction phase. And good luck to you if you can find those <laughs> in your country because we still struggle to find uh, flucytosine. I think there are other things that we can consider. Um, candida albicans often causes severe morbidity in children, anemia, renal and liver impairment, histoplasmosis, leishmaniasis, and other region-specific causes of advanced disease in children, which I don't see, um, and then sequelae of other illnesses such as chronic lung disease and others often um, cause more what the patients think is advanced disease than what we think. So again, I think we need to broaden the package of care. 
I think we need access to oxygen and non-invasive ventilation, mobile blood culture, laboratories, special feeds and milk to manage children with chronic diarrhea, and appropriate antibiotics and medication. Um, and I think we need to start to consider non-communicable diseases in this space as well. Whoops. So there are many challenges. I actually stole this slide from an adult advanced HIV disease, but I've added in here a lack of child-specific focus because I still think we're extrapolating evidence from adult studies and we need to start to look from a pediatric perspective. So there also are many research gaps. Um, we don't know so much about how many children die after discharge, how many are readmitted, what is the ultimate package of care that we need to give. There are many questions regarding treatment and prevention. So which of these children had advanced HIV disease? The answer is, of course, all of them. And these are my conclusions. I think children and adolescents can present in many ways at, at any time with advanced HIV disease. Um, it's not just about PJP and TB, CMV and cryptococcal disease, um, and we do need more than ART. Thank you.